Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Accreditation Part 2, where we will talk about the process of becoming accredited. This class is brought to you by the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists, or ICAPGen. My name is Jenny Hansen, and I'm an accredited genealogist. The content of this video, as well as the thoughts, views, and opinions expressed herein, belong solely to the creator and do not necessarily reflect the views of FamilySearch International and RootsTech. For the purpose of this class today, we will be taking an overview of the process for accrediting. ICAPGen has designed the accreditation process to improve and test your skills for real-world client research. The information that we talk about today is also available on the ICAPGen website, which is icapgen.org. You can look for the section that says become accredited if it's located both at the top and the bottom of the web page. The AG credential is awarded by the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists, which is a fully independent nonprofit organization run mostly by volunteers. Everything you need to know can be found at the ICAPGen site under the Guide for Applying for an Accredited Genealogist Credential. This guide contains more specific details and resources on how to prepare. The guide's available for both the old testing track and the new, so whichever time you pop into the accreditation process, you can find the information that you need on the webpage. To begin with, you're going to want to choose from one of over 30 different testing regions that you could specialize in. One of the reasons the ICAPGen has chosen to base their credential on a specific testing region is because it allows you to become more expert in that region. So tests for additional regions are in various stages of development, and all good research requires similar skills and understanding of methodology. I personally am accredited in doing research in Denmark, but that doesn't mean that I only know how to do research in Denmark. For example, my Danish research skills can help me with research all through Scandinavia, several European countries, and of course the basics in the US. So just because you're choosing one region doesn't mean that you're limited to only doing research there. There's currently nine different regions in the US. This is the most common area to become accredited. These regions are formed because they have similar types of records and a similar history. As you work in a region, you will learn the important skills for that particular region. For example, in the Gulf South, there were a lot of records lost due to the wars and natural disasters. So there's what people refer to as burned out counties. So you have to learn the different strategies to work through these different areas and become really proficient in the records that do exist and those that don't and know the workarounds that will work out best for the area that you're interested in. Let's talk about the logistics of the actual test. So there are three different levels in the testing process and each of these levels has two sections. Level one is the readiness assessment and a four generation project. Level two is two different exams, one on document interpretation and one on general genealogy questions. And level three consists of a four hour research project and then an oral review with the board of experts. Each of these levels has to be passed at 90% proficiency, but don't panic even though 90% seems really high. If you don't pass a portion of the exam, you just need to go and redo the portion that you did not pass. And once the entire level is passed at 90%, you can move on to the next level. Uh, each level needs to be passed with at least 90%. So for example, if you passed the level two document interpretation, but not the general questions, you'll need to go back and retake the part of the test that you missed. Once you pay the fee for each level, you have one calendar year to submit the project or to take the test. And after three attempts, a candidate needs to wait 12 months before trying again. In other words, you can try three, three times within that calendar year. And after that, we'd like you to go back and maybe sharpen up your skills before you come and retest on that section again. One of the benefits is the, of the ICAPGen test is that you can take it anywhere in the world. If you look at the ICAPGen webpage, it will give you more information about the details and the logistics of the actual testing. Uh, 
You have up to three years between each level. So if life gets busy or crazy or something unexpected comes up, don't panic. It doesn't have to derail you completely. You'll be renewing every five years to make sure that you're keeping your skills sharp and that you're up to date within the industry. Uh, this will entail giving us a list of your recent education and submitting a five to eight page client report that you've done within those last five years. The level one includes accreditation readiness. So the readiness assessment is to ensure that you're prepared with sufficient experience. We don't want you to dive into this process if you're unprepared. We're trying to set you up for success. So a readiness assessment will include things like doing a thousand hours of research. I know that seems like a lot, but any time that you have spent on any type of research or gathering information or attending classes, all of these things can contribute to your 1000 hours of experience. So like I said, things like conferences, reading blogs, reading books, um, attending webinars from your own home, all of these will count to help your hours. 500 of those 1000 hours need to be in your specific area of interest. So if you're choosing a region within the United States, Go ahead and research wherever you'd like, but have at least 500 of your hours focused on that specific geographical region. And even within those 500 hours would suggest that you use at least 80 hours in each administrative division within that. So that would mean each state within your region, or if you're doing England, uh, spend this bulk of time in each of the different counties or um, in just the different types of records so that you are really thoroughly vetted and experienced in the records for your area. You'll then need to move on to your four generation project. This is going to be client type research. So it's something that you might do if you were working for a professional genealogy research company or if you had an independent client of your own. You will be choosing the family. It could even be your own family or it could be another family that you're interested in. You'll need to include four connecting generations and each of those needs to have one life event within the region of interest. The first generation of that family needs to have been born on or before a rolling birth date 80 years before submission. So for example, if you're going to start your accreditation process in the year 2020, you would need to have somebody who was born at least by 1940 so that you have that 80 year span that we're working with. And that first individual must be deceased and they don't necessarily need to be married, but if they were, the spouse must also be deceased so that we're not doing this thorough research on living individuals. It shows that you're going to be reliant upon the records and not on someone's um, knowledge or remembrance of the facts. One of the benefits of the ICAPGEM process is that others can read and edit your project. So as you're working on this larger four generation project, we'd encourage you to have another set of eyes look over it or someone with genealogical expertise, look over your methodology and make sure that you're approaching this in the right way. We encourage you to have others edit your project. And as part of the ICAP Gen study groups, others will be reading and editing your project as well as you reading and editing others' projects. Um, there is a 40 page limit and we ask you to only include 40 documents, which will require you to kind of weed things down so that you only have your 40 most important documents. Your research can already be completed before you start into this, um, the process of actually committing. This can be something that you've been working on for years and years. You don't have to just try to put it together all in one calendar year's time. So here is what your four generation project needs to include. You'll need to have your report, like we mentioned, as if it was written for a client a pedigree chart that shows these four families, the four generations included, family group sheets on those four families, and as we mentioned, key sources that um, only include your top 40 documents. We'd also like to see a research log with both your positive and negative searches. We wanna be able to see everything that you have done as you compile this large project. The report needs to include a uh, very clear and strong objective. Anytime you start out client work, you're going to state what the client is hoping to find so that the goal is very clear and um, easy to find for anybody who's reading the report. 
Then you're going to have your evidence analysis saying that these are the records we looked at and here's why we looked at them and here's what we learned from them. One thing that ICAP Gen is looking for is not just a report that has the records that you found, but it wants to know everything that you looked at. So we want to be able to see that you can think through the evidence of your project. We also need to see your source citations. We need to know that you know how to cite your sources. We need to be able to see that anybody could pick up this report and go back and find the original records that you looked at. If you don't know how to cite your sources, there's plenty of uh, different webinars and books and so many different references that you can appeal to to better your education in that department. We want to see any transcriptions or abstractions that would be included on your documents. And we want to see a list of future recommendations. You'll always want to conclude your client report with ideas for the next time. It's a great way to keep clients moving along. And it's also a great way for you to wrap up your thoughts and be able to say, hey, based on these records we looked at, here's where we need to go next. So the level two, after you've passed your level one and your uh, four generation project has been approved, Level two comprises two tests. So the first test is document interpretation and the second one is general questions. Each exam is open note and each exam comprises about two hours. The theme of the document interpretation test is to see how well you can work and move on with various documents that you might encounter in your research. So let's talk about some of those questions that you might be faced with. First of all, we'll ask you to identify documents, and then we're going to, going to ask you where you might find it. What information does the document tell us, and what information does it infer? We might ask you to transcribe, abstract, or translate the document. If you're working in an area with a foreign language, you will need to know how to uh, transcribe and translate some of these records. You're also going to need to create a research plan based on the document and the information that's found therein. We're trying to help you create a real world client scenario. Clients hardly come to you with a nice clean research log and all these documents to um, confirm what they have written there. Really, we're trying to do that for the client. They usually come to us with a bit of a mess or a lot of questions, and we're trying to find documents that will help clean up and clarify the information they already know. So this idea of document interpretation is really quite fundamental to um, what a proficient professional genealogist does. Some of the level two general questions will uh, contain topics about research in lots of different places. So some examples of questions for you there are the history or the geography of the region, some of the important record types that are found there, different methodology questions, because we all know that good methodology applies to all different regions and all different types of research. Um, you're going to be asked to both about online and offline sources, meaning things that you'll find on your computer and things that you're going to have to actually look at either in a book, microfilm, uh, different resources like that. We're also going to be asking you about research planning and how you can put together a research plan based on the documents that you look at. What are you going to be your first steps in the way that you approach a research project? On ICAP Gen's website, they have the important record types for each region. This is a great resource. These are the must knows. <laughs> Although these level two exams are open book, you need to have a good working knowledge already. If you're not familiar with the different records, it's not going to do you any good to be able to go and have to look them up. You're going to need to be able to work quicker than that because we want you to be able to uh, demonstrate to us how you would work when you're on a client's timetable. Some of the ideas to be familiar with in the methodology portion would be um, the best strategies to use with your research. So which records would you look at first? Why would you look at those? How would you use them? And what would you hope to find from them? You'll want to have quick reference sheets for all of your different methodologies. And these are what's included in those um, the open book section that we talked about. If you can compile quick reference sheets for yourself, you'll be in a far better position to succeed with your exam. 
Here's an example of one of these sample methodology sheets. This was compiled to help someone identify finding a spouse or finding a maiden name. So just some examples of what you might consider including in these methodology sheets. Some different sources, some ideas of the first records to look at, the next tier of records to look at, what I can help to find and where those records might be located. And remember that any time you spend gathering information and compiling these research guides for yourself will benefit you for your future research work and those can go towards your 1000 hours of research readiness. Here's another example that you could use for understanding different types of military records. So if you're trying to find someone's spouse, you could see what types of records might list that. These research methodology sheets make my research a lot more efficient and effective. And having them written down is great. It's great to have these resources, but you'll find that as you compile uh, different kind of resources like this for yourself, the information plants itself in your mind so much better and you become a lot quicker and a lot more efficient with your time. The ICAPGen YouTube channel has lots of different tutorials about sources just like this. For example, there's a whole video that you can watch about how to create a research reference guide on that YouTube channel. Just do a search for ICAPGen on either YouTube or even within Google, and you'll see the whole list of videos that are available to you. And one of those will be how to create a research reference guide. When you're compiling these, there's a few different ways that you can do that. You could use Evernote, you could use Google Docs, you could even just create a normal document for yourself. If you're considering getting credentialed, building your research reference guides can count towards your hours of preparedness. We frequently are asked, how do I find the information to put into these reference guides? Well, my favorite is the FamilySearch Wiki. I think that's a just a gold mine of information. Other things that you can look at are the Family History Library Catalog, other databases like in Find My Past, Ancestry, Family Search, etc. Uh, Cindy's list is still valid even though it's been around forever. We tend to kind of push that one off and not think that it's as good as it used to be. Uh, sites like Linkpendium, and then there's of course all the different reference books, different blogs that are available, so many different online sources that you can consult to help compile these methodology sheets. Once you pass these two exams on level two, you will move on to level three. Level three is a proctored four hour research project. You might think four hours is not very long to do a research project, and that's right. We don't expect you to create a huge four and five page document for this uh, pretend client that you're doing research for. We want to see that you know how to do research and how to go about constructing a project for a client. Once that level's passed, you'll move on to an oral review. So the project, this four hour project, would be really similar to that level one four generation project that you did, but like I said, you only have four hours. So within that four hour time frame, we wanna see a report, which might just be one page. We wanna see the pedigree chart that would show what generations you were trying to link, family group sheet that identifies everyone that was included in your research, source documents, what did you look at? Tell us, show us that you know how to cite those sources even when you're on a time crunch. And we wanna see your research log. We wanna know what you've done. How did you go about approaching this tricky short project? This four hour research project is your time to shine. Show us that you're ready to take on client work. Prove to yourself that you have the confidence and the ability to work with a time crunch. This is going to create a real, real time research experience for you. And we wanna see that you know how to do it. So the final step after you have finished out that four hour project, you'll be invited to uh, meet with an oral board of review. And I know this sounds terrifying. My experience was a little bit intimidating because I walked into a room and I knew those people sitting on the board and I knew that they did not know me, but they were people that I had respected and admired. And um, I felt intimidated by it, but I was really surprised at what a friendly experience it was. By the time you get to this last step in accrediting, everyone's cheering for you and everyone wants you to succeed. 
So there's no um, extra travel required for this. It can all be done on a video chat. Plan to have this last for about two hours. And one of the great things that um, happens in this level three board of review is that if there's been any little holes, you know, even though you've had to pass each level at that 90%, if your board is reviewing the things that you've done and says, mm, this is still a weak spot for this person, rather than telling you that you don't pass, they might just assign you a project to help you become a little bit more proficient in that area where they see the hole. It really is a friendly, encouraging um, stage to be in the accreditation process. So when you consider all the steps that it takes to become accredited, you're going to understand that it really is an investment of your time, but it will make you such a more efficient and qualified researcher. It will give you the confidence you need to be able to charge people to do their work for them. An accredited research has learned the excellent skills that carry to all different levels of research. Thank you for joining me for this overview of the process of accrediting. This class has been brought to you by the ICAP Gen. Any questions that you have about the process will likely be answered by going to the ICAP Gen webpage, which is here at the bottom of the slide, www.icapgen.org. Again, my name is Jenny Hansen, and I thank you for joining me. Good luck in the process.